All right, so the emission of the helium atom. We're going to move on to the next element in the series. We started with hydrogen and using the Bohr atomic model of the atom, um, we got a pretty successful result. So let's see what happens if we graduate onto helium. All right, helium has an atomic number of two, so this is going to change the picture a little bit. So Z squared doesn't go away. Now we have to account for it. We have to plug in the value of Z, which is the atomic number of helium, in other words, two. And we're going to see what happens if we decay to the Palmer series, the same series that gave us the visible light for hydrogen. Okay, so now Z squared, since Z is equal to two, Z squared will equal four. Um, decaying to the uh, Balmer series, so where n final is 2, and starting at n equals 3, or n equals 4, or n equals 5, or n equals 6, if we carry out the calculations, we're going to find out that the energies are 10 to negative 18 joules for all of the numbers involved, starting in about 1.2 and going up to 1.9. But the fact that we're 10 to negative 18 joules means that we are outside of the visible region. Specifically, we're somewhere in the ultraviolet region. So this is not providing visible light for helium. Um, so let's try to find out where visible light will actually be emitted. Now the process is kind of, you know, convoluted, you could say. Uh, there's a few other ways to do it, but I'll show you one. And, you know, I kind of will leave it up to you as to whether you like it or not and whether you want to approach it a different way. Uh, you could always plug in values for n initial and n final, get the value of the energy, and if it matches with what's in, you know, within the visible region, then you got visible light. But I'm going to show you a different approach to doing this thing. Specifically, I'm going to concentrate on the fact that the upper limit of visible light is 4.97 times 10 to negative 19 joules, and the lower limit is 2.48 times 10 to negative 19 joules. Um, and for helium, we know that the atomic number is 2, so we're going to square 2 to get 4. We're going to multiply the Palmer constant by 4, and this will give a value of negative 8.72 times 10 to negative 18 joules. Uh, also, notice that I have input a value of 7 for n initial. This is a complete guess on my part. I don't know whether n initial equaling 7 is going to work out for delivering visible light, but I'm choosing a value for n initial that is a little bit high. And by high, I mean 6 and above. Like go, go higher. Although we already did the calculation for n equals 6, and we know that that doesn't give visible light from the previous slide. Um, so I'm choosing the next higher value, 7. Uh, usually when you go with higher values like 7, 8, 9, even 10, you're kind of safe in terms of getting to a region where you could get a positive answer. But all right, going back to this. Palmer constant times 2 square is 8.72 times 10 to negative 18 joules. Here I'm going to play a mathematical trick. Notice what I did right here. 8.72 times 10 to negative 18 is the same thing as 87.2 times 10 to the negative 19. And the reason why I made this change of moving the decimal number is such that I made the exponent equal to the exponents of the visible light. And the reason why is because I am going to simplify the problem. If I make 10 to negative 19 the exponent for the Balmer c square constant, then the 10 to negative 19 uh, exponent for the upper and lower energy boundaries of the energy will basically cancel out. And instead of having to write the 10 to negative 19, I'll basically just cancel it out entirely. And so now I'll just write negative 4.97 for the changing energy for the upper boundary and negative 2.48 for the lower boundary. And that will equal the negative 87.2 on both sides of the equation. Now, before I continue, I want to point out that I went out of my way to put a negative in front of the upper and lower boundaries of the visible energy. The reason being we are looking at the emission of light. And because this is emission we're looking for, the energy change has to be negative. If you forget to make the changing energy negative, you will get an answer, but the answer will probably be you know, nonsensical. In the worst case scenario, you might even end up with an imaginary number, which needless to say, 
is not good. <laughs> not within the context of physical uh, parameters. Okay, so we're gonna input the negative of the upper energy and the negative of the lower energy in the visible spectrum. And we're gonna equal this to negative BC squared. If you prefer to leave the exponents and not mess around with the decimals, that's totally fine with me. Um, it'll take a little bit extra to input the numbers, but it'll work the same way. All right, now what I'm gonna do is try to find out if my assumption that n initial equals seven is good enough to end up with visible light. So what I do is I divide both sides by negative 87.2. I do that on both sides of the equations. This is gonna yield a positive number that will be less than one on both sets of the equations. Um, here, what I would do now is divide one by 49 and get the value. And the value is roughly 0 0.0204. And that's being subtracted from 1 over n final square. So now what we get to do is add 0 0.0204 to both sides in order to isolate 1 over n final square. So we added 0 0.0204 to 0 0.0570 and we added 0 0.0204 to 0 0.0284. Okay. All right, now what we do is we cross multiply. We multiply by n final square and we divide by 0 0.0774 on the left side of the equation. And over here on the right side, we cross multiply. So we multiply by m final square and divide by 0 0.0488. Okay, so that will bring the m final to the top portion of the fraction. And at this point, we take the square root of both sides to isolate for the value of n final. All right, so if you carry the calculation, you're going to find out that m final on the left side is 3.6. On the right side, we're going to find out it's 4.5. And this is where your analysis comes in. You are ultimately looking for a value of m final that is a whole number. This number cannot have decimal points. If you start putting decimals for your quantum numbers, what you have ultimately done is negate the idea of quantized energy. If you put decimals, you're basically saying energy is a continuum, it's not quantized. So we need to make sure that we hit a whole number value. And by looking at the upper limit and lower limit of energy, what we're really looking for is to see if this number and that number have a lower value in between. And between 3.6 and 4.5, there indeed resides a whole number, specifically four. So and final, based on this calculation, is thought to be equal to four. And since n initial was equal to 7, we now know that the transition that will lead to visible light is the one where you start at n equals 7 and n, and n equals 4. And in case you are unsure that that's true, simply plug in 7 for n initial and 4 for n final and see what you get for the energy. You'll find out that the value lies within 4.97 times 10 to the negative 19 and 2.48 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Okay, now um, with a few calculations, we can actually find out that there's a few iterations that allow us to basically come up with um, some other aspects of visible light. Uh, now, I was mentioning that if you go and um, decay the electron down to the fourth energy level, this is known as a different series, it's called the bracket series. And uh, the bracket series generates a few numbers. Uh, so four is now your n initial, uh, excuse me, your n final. Your n initial can be seven, six, or five. And if you actually input those values for n initial and four for n final and do the calculation for helium, you find out that the numbers are negative 1.96, negative 3.03, .03, and negative 3.67, all multiplied by 10 to the negative 19 joules. And specifically, we find out that Here we go. We find out that the energy change involving the transitions from 6 to 4, 7 to 4, and even 4 to 3 lead to visible light. Um, now, I personally, if I ask you for a problem of this sort, will only ask you for one transition. I only care to see if you can calculate one transition that leads to visible light. But as you can see, there are multitudes of combinations that can actually make that happen. And so, you know, one answer is not necessarily the only answer for this type of problem. Uh, but one thing that has to be said is that 
okay, we perform the equation, we use the previous Balmer equation, and we determine the value of n final based on some n initials. But when we actually compare their predicted values to the observed values, we find out that in some cases, um, the prediction is actually pretty poor. And we have actually omitted some of the actual values that get observed. So there is a problem with the Balmer equation, a problem that um, ultimately has to do with the fact that helium doesn't just have one electron, it actually has two. And what this means is that, um, you know, we have to look at something else. Now I'm gonna stop the video right here and uh, we'll discuss the other aspects that need to be incorporated to account for the fact that multiple electrons lead to a different picture altogether for the interaction of electron to nucleus.